So welcome again, everyone, to uh, I guess this is the second installment of CAFC's webinar series related to child development and, rehabil and children's rehabilitation. And this is also part two of our series with the CIHR team in Parenting Matters. Uh, our last webinar was with uh, the, the co-leads of that project, Peter, Dr. Peter Rosenbaum and Lucy Lott, uh, which was just a general overview of the Parenting Matters um, findings around uh, the impact of, uh, of on caregivers of having a child with a neurodevelopmental disorder. Uh, today's part two is uh, brings a separate uh, two other presenters from within that Parenting Matters group. Uh, and the title today is Fathering in the Context of Childhood Disability and Health Conditions. And with us today we have uh, uh, Drs. Ted McNeil and David Nicholas. Uh, Ted is from as an associate professor at the Factor in, in, in Wintash faculty Faculty of Social Work at the University of Toronto, and David Nicholas is an associate professor in the Faculty of Social Social Work at University of Calgary. So, without uh, oh, actually, just one more reminder is that uh, this uh, during this presentation we'll, we will be having a few poll questions. Um, some of you may have uh, participated in the polls in the past, but you may not have. So, uh, just some instructions on that. When we put up a poll question, you'll see the questions appear on your screen, and that just gives you an opportunity to read the question or listen to the question as I read it. Uh, and then you can click on your screen selecting your answer and we'll give everyone in the audience a chance to um, put in an answer. We'll flip the, the answers back and, and, and then go back on with the presentation. If you are, many of you are watching as a group uh, with uh, many people in the room and unfortunately we can only accept one answer per, per line. So you'll have to come, somehow figure out how to come to consensus within your group in order to put in a single answer. Uh, so without any further ado, I would like to uh, hand uh, the presentation over to um, Ted McNeil uh, from the uh, Faculty of Social Work at the University of Toronto. Over to you, Ted. Doug, thank you very much. And it is uh, really such a pleasure uh, to be here. David and I have been looking forward to this opportunity to uh, share some ideas with you and talk about uh, some of the work that we've been involved in. We just wish that we could see all of you. <clears throat> this is... Um, incredible this uh, technology is uh, that we can connect and have this dialogue across the country. Uh, David, I don't know where you are. I'm uh, sitting at home here this morning and this is pretty pretty convenient. Yeah, I'm sitting in my office. Welcome everyone. Well, you know, in healthcare we talk a lot about uh, family-centered care, but the, uh, the reality is we haven't known a lot about the experience of, of fathers. And so one of the things that we are going to invite everyone to be thinking about is, uh, is this notion of family-centered care, and, and do we really practice it uh, when we do our work? And um, we'll be exploring this and many other uh, issues as we go this morning. Uh, uh, Skip a slide here. So uh, first of all, we just wanted to share with you a little bit where we're headed with the uh, presentation. We want to talk a, a little bit about uh, fatherhood in context and uh, we'll be talking a little bit uh, really a very little bit about uh, some history uh, some of the theoretical lens that may be useful for uh, understanding fatherhood we want to do a, a literature review over the last uh, 10 to 15 years in particular and then David and I have some research uh, uh, that we want to share with you and we'll be highlighting some key findings from a couple of studies uh, specifically related to, to fathers. And one study that uh, examines uh, the couple relationship and really looks at fathering and mothering in the context of their relationship. Uh, and this is where some of the Parenting Matters uh, research is, uh, is headed as well. We want to end uh, our presentation today with uh, some discussion about the implications for practice. and. Um, this is where we'd like to introduce the first uh, four questions, uh, Doug, if we could. We would like to uh, begin to invite everyone to think about some of these issues that we'll be talking about today. So the first question you should see up on your screen now is, do you routinely consider fathers' experiences related to their child's condition? So you should see uh, the question and the, and the two uh, answer choices, the yes or no question up on your screen. So I think most people have put in a response, so we'll just flip the results around. So 70%, and even 70% have said yes, they do routinely consider the father's experience, and 30% have said no. Okay. So the next question 
is as a clinician, do you routinely ask fathers about how they are coping with handling their daughter's or son's health condition? So we'll just share those results. So we've got an, uh, it, was, it was an even 50-50 for a while there, but 54% the have said yes, they do routinely ask fathers, and 46% have said no. We'll just go on to the third question. Is our mother's versus father's experience of parenting a child with a disability similar? So for this, we've got 86% say no, uh, a mother's versus father's experience are not similar, and 14% have said yes, that they do feel that they are similar. And the last question I think that we're going to do for this first little section segment of poll questions is, is society more supportive of ch mother-child relationships than father-child relationships? And I guess, again, a yes or no question. All right, so we'll just share those results. Uh, and it says 97% have said yes, that society is more supportive of mother-child relationships than father-child relationships. Well, thank you, Doug, and uh, thanks to all of you for uh, responding. Uh, gee, these are very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, responses, and um, I would generally uh, agree with the findings, uh, not unlike uh, what we would see in the literature, and, um, uh, and interesting that we uh, that we do think about fathers, but we may not as health care providers uh, actively uh, uh, engage them or uh, talk with them about uh, their experiences. So we'll come back to uh, this and be thinking about these kinds of issues as we go. But let's uh, turn now and look at some his historical perspectives. And what we want to do here is really to begin to set the stage with uh, some of the kinds of um, ideas and particularly uh, history that uh, may be relevant in understanding uh, fatherhood. And clearly fatherhood has been evolving uh, really since the beginning of time. And if we look back in history at uh, some early societies, the hunter-gatherer societies, uh, for example, um, Historians speculate that unless fathers were taken very far afield to find food, that they were uh, often uh, foraging for food uh, close to home, and in fact that uh, often uh, mothers and fathers were, were both engaged in, uh, in carrying out this activity uh, in some of the kind of primitive uh, living uh, circumstances of the time. Uh, parents would have had to pay very close attention to their uh, children uh, for fear of uh, snakes or animals, uh, open pit, open pit uh, fires and so forth. And so fathers were probably in fairly close uh, proximity then. And uh, even if we move into the Middle Ages, if we think about uh, particularly in terms of Western history, we can probably only focus uh, most on Western history at this point. Uh, but um, Families often live together in very small circumstances. Uh, their uh, lifestyle was uh, governed in many ways by uh, uh, the natural light that they uh, received during the day. And uh, uh, again, fathers were probably in very close proximity. And also during that time, uh, a lot of evidence points to mothers having various kinds of um, uh, uh, crafts and things that they would do to uh, um, whether it was uh, weaving and uh, selling some of their supplies or brewing, uh, uh, would have taken them uh, from the home. This time also, we're aware that um, about 8% of women died in, uh, in childbirth. And it was interesting to me to, to read that between 1600 and 1800, speculated that uh, up to 24% of children uh, lived in lone uh, father households. Uh, versus the uh, one to two percent uh, today, so times have, have really uh, been changing through this uh, through history. It was really the industrial revolution that is credited with hardening the distinction between uh, men and women. And during this time in the late 1800s, uh, men began to work more men than women, although not exclusively, uh, outside the home in uh, uh, various factories and industries. Sometimes taking them at long distances from home, and it was. Uh, at this time that the distinctions and the gender roles for men and women began to change more dramatically. Uh, women representing the, the kind of emotional hub of the family and uh, fathers the, the breadwinner role. And if we, if we 
take a, a leap forward in time to look at fatherhood today, there are really some competing models that, uh, that we that read about and hear about. There's the so-called deficit model that we sometimes see in uh, popular uh, uh, culture that uh, portrays uh, fathers as um, uh, really not very uh, uh, capable. And uh, the, the literature, some of it uh, is, is certainly um, uh, valid uh, about deadbeat dads and uh, they're uh, not really holding up uh, their end of things in terms of the paying support payments and so forth. And this is contrasted of course with an idea of new fatherhood and this is the, the very engaged, uh, involved uh, uh, fatherhood, fathers rather. And fatherhood in many ways has become a kind of a politicized uh, domain and particularly in the last uh, 40 or 50 years uh, with uh, so many more women working outside of the home, fundamental questions about the, the fairness of uh, gender roles and the work that is uh, needed to be done to run a household uh, have come to the fore. So we can see that it's a, uh, it's a history that has uh, many factors uh, that uh, are, are often in play and perhaps from this we can begin to see that um, studying fatherhood is, is really quite a complex uh, phenomena and it's worth pausing just to think a little bit about the lens that we would use to uh, understand this and um, one of the perspectives that, uh, that David and I would uh, set out for, uh, for you to consider would be the use of the social ecological theory and what appeals to us about this is that uh, this approach which is a, a systems based uh, model uh, invites us to think about factors not only at the individual level or the micro level but as you can see here uh, also looking at fatherhood from an interpersonal uh, context uh, and linkages uh, with uh, friends outside the, uh, the family, with the work in particular, and also that any phenomena, and particularly a uh, phenomenon like uh, fatherhood, is also subject to some broader uh, forces at play in society, sometimes referred to as uh, um, structural kinds of influences. But these have to do with uh, policies, and changing social expectations, uh, the SDOH here really stands for the social determinants of health and we've in the healthcare field have come to appreciate just how powerful some of the uh, external um, uh, forces of society are such as uh, poverty and social exclusion that can impact on uh, in, in this case uh, uh, fathers. Number two here is, uh, is re makes reference to the interpretive paradigm or social constructionism or symbolic interactionism. And the idea here is that um, all of us interpret our world. We make sense of the world around us. And if we were just to think about our experience today in this uh, seminar, even though we will have a shared experience, uh, we will ultimately take away from this uh, time together uh, a, a unique uh, set of experiences. We may uh, agree with some of the things that we talk about, we may find things that we disagree with or uh, issues that we want to think a little bit more about or read more about and ultimately we do that uh, in a very uh, individual uh, interpretive kind of way. And finally um, layering on all of this uh, uh, a risk and resilience model uh, where we would identify some of the forces and factors that uh, may come into play and thinking about them in terms of uh, potentially risk factors that may make it more difficult for men to be effective fathers uh, or protective factors that may uh, facilitate uh, uh, fathering. So the, 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 the third leg of this that we wanted to share with you is uh, our own social locations and uh, uh, you can see on the right hand side here um, a couple of pictures. Uh, this is David and I. Uh, David uh, on the uh, right in the top picture and myself on the left. Uh, this was taken in China. We happened to uh, be at a conference uh, together a number of years ago and uh, so we are uh, introducing ourselves to, the, to you this way. But uh, we are both uh, fathers 
uh, each with a partner and uh, coincidentally each have uh, two children uh, uh, and a dog we've come to understand. Uh, we are respectively, uh, David and I, middle-aged and uh, older, white, heterosexual males and as men we realize that we may represent just about everything that's wrong with the world. Uh, uh, whether we're talking about uh, the world economy or uh, political repression or abuse of power, or corporate greed, um, these are very often attributed to, to uh, white heterosexual males and while David and I don't feel that we have a whole lot to, uh, uh, of influence in, in these domains, um, we do uh, talk a lot about uh, fatherhood and uh, have really valued our experience uh, as fathers and really find it one of the, the most, if not the most, meaningful experience in life. And to have the opportunity to um, parent one's uh, children and to have an enduring relationship over time is, uh, is truly special and we are uh, indeed very privileged in this way. We don't face uh, some of the kinds of obstacles uh, such as uh, poverty or social exclusion that, uh, that some uh, parents uh, may face. So enough about us. Uh, we want to uh, move on here now and begin to uh, talk about the literature and some of the outcomes that have been associated with uh, involved fathers. And we want to credit uh, the work of Sarah Allen and Carrie Daly from the University of Guelph here who have uh, done a wonderful summary uh, of the literature uh, looking at uh, some of the positive uh, outcomes associated with involved fathers. And this is um, uh, correlational research. Uh, fathers don't cause these uh, positive outcomes, but uh, involved, engaged fathers are correlated. Uh, they're related to children having uh, more positive outcomes in these areas. So, so in, the, in the area of cognitive development, uh, for example, uh, children's cognitive competence, their academic performance, uh, achieving uh, higher levels in school and, uh, and even future career success. Emotional development, having a secure attachment, being more curious, ability to handle stress, feeling less depression, more life satisfaction associated with involved fathers. Social development, uh, uh, being competent socially, being related to others, being connected, uh, feeling connected, less conflict with others uh, are all associated uh, with involved fathers. Uh, and although it's not on this slide, uh, there's a, a literature as well that points to um, more positive outcomes both for mothers uh, and for fathers themselves of being uh, engaged in their, uh, their role as a parent. In summary here, again, just what key messages uh, would be is that positive child outcomes are associated with involved fatherhood, fathers rather, and negative child outcomes uh, are associated with absent or particularly abusive uh, fathers. And what we're not saying here, though, is that uh, fathers are essential. We don't believe that fathers are absolutely essential or perhaps uh, beyond our, our shared uh, biological roles, uh, uh, perhaps neither parent is absolutely essential. And as evidence, we would uh, point to the success of uh, single parents or uh, lesbian parents or, or gay fathers uh, in, in successfully uh, raising children. So uh, David, I think that I am turning over to you at this point in time. Sure, thanks Ted. Um, I, I want to just turn our discussion a little bit uh, from the uh, uh, looking at the, the fatherhood literature in general to rather focus on, on fathering a child with a chronic health condition or disability. And Ted, if we can go to the next slide. Um, when, we, when we look at that literature, first of all, there's been a, a growth in that literature, although not to the extent of the, the motherhood literature. But the literature that does exist generally speaks to the fact that fathers are profoundly affected by their child's condition, uh, health condition or disability. And, and studies uh, in, in, in generally speak to uh, father, father's levels, levels of stress or, or uh, adaptive challenges. Um, they, they, they 
in varying degrees talk about the, the issue of um, fathers seeking to maintain control or manage uncertainty or difficulty that has, has, uh, they, they, their family has encountered and some of the struggles that they, they face as they, as they move forward with that. And I, I think I, what is interesting in this literature is this recurrent notion of, of fathers suffering or walking through this this unique form of parenting and, and grappling with the complex waters of, of this form of fathering uh, in, in relative isolation um, in, in varying degrees, not for all fathers certainly, but um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but the fa who, who do fathers rely on for support? Often it is, uh, it is con conveyed in the literature as their partner and which, which pre pre presents challenges when their their partner their wife are themselves um, grappling with with the experiences or emotions or, or, or role demands related to to caregiving and uh, and so it, it it imposes a challenge both individually and and as a couple or as a, as a, a co-parenting unit um, some of the the barriers to adaptation for fathers that emerge in the literature speak to um, financial insecurity and poverty. Ted mentioned some of those issues and, and I think related to that is um, workplace policies that may be um, unsupportive or maybe appear supportive on the surface but as they're, as they're lived out in the chronicity of illness or the ongoing challenges of an enduring health condition um, uh, become less supportive of fathers and, and I, I think particularly um, imposes risk for fathers who who lack flexibility in the workplace, or um, or who who lose pay or lose jobs, and and what that means for families when um, one one parent, for instance, needs to to focus on the care needs of the child. So you can see the pressures that may emerge, and that that appears periodically in the literature. Um, Ted Ted spoke to some of the socio historical issues of some of the discursive uh, pressures or um, uh, perspectives on fatherhood uh, and and how that is is conveyed and lived out and sort of in the social discourse and and it may be even played out in in how fathers are, are viewed or responded to in, in in various settings including the, the clinical encounter Ted can we go to the next slide um, in response to that, though, fathers, the, the fatherhood literature um, is is increasingly speaking to a a, uh, a resilience or how fathers navigate this this parenting journey in terms of of chronic health conditions, um, and and one of the things that emerges is this the important role that uh, fathers play in the life of their children and and the the sometimes shifting experience of fatherhood with the introduction of, of a chronic health condition and, and fathers um, are, are reported to, to uh, enrich the relationship with their children, um, both the, the child with the health condition and, and their siblings and in some cases their partner, although sometimes there are, there are increased pressures on the, on the couple relationship. Um, the, the literature speaks to um, fathers shifting in terms of priorities and perspectives um, w with the, the, uh, the, experiencing, the experience of, of a child with chronic health conditions and sometimes that occurs over the course of time and one of the challenges in the literature is often um, the, the a lifespan approach isn't, isn't taken and so we don't see the, the movement of that, that perspective perspective shift, but nonetheless fathers talk about this notion of trying to make meaning of this process and, and, and how that, that evolves over the course of time. Um, fathers and mothers uh, uh, in varying degrees immerse themselves in, in, the, in the care for their children and for, for fathers, in some fatherhood based research, um, there is reference to how that becomes a, a, a helpful resource in terms of, of engaging in, in sort of an action-oriented um, 
process of being part of that caregiving journey. And, and um, yet it, it also presents a challenge in terms of, of the tension or the balance of, of employment and grappling with, with the, the responsibilities versus caregiving and, and, and managing that. And I think that's, that's a big issue uh, for mothers as well as we look in the motherhood literature, but also for fathers, um, and particularly when the, the, the breadwinning roles need to be sort of reconfigured for the, for the family unit. Um, as I spoke about earlier, the reliance on the partner and, and spouse for support, and, and sometimes to the exclusion of other sources of support, uh, appears uh, in the fatherhood uh, literature, and, and to me, it seems somewhat unique from from the, the mothering literature. And I think, uh, as I spoke about earlier, can impose some challenges in terms of the, the couple relationship, which which I think we'll exemplify it a little later in our presentation. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, Ted. Ted is navigating the slides here. This uh, busy slide uh, focuses on the determinants of fathering experience. Um, and, and, and we see some interesting studies that have emerged quite recently, uh, one by Hartley and colleagues who contrasted findings for fathers of, of youth and young adults with, with uh, three, three conditions, Down syndrome, Fragile X, and Autism Spectrum Disorders. And they found that fathers of individuals with Down syndrome reported lower pessimism than, than, uh, than Fragile X and, and the ASD group. Um, f the fathers of, of adolescents and young adults with, with autism spectrum disorder um, tended towards higher, uh, higher scores in terms of depression scores. Um, and and it was in these were interestingly related to several factors. Um, fathers older age, um, more children in the family uh, with a disability, which which may be more likely in some conditions over others, and uh, and also behavior problems in the child, which I I believe this this uh, offers some interesting parallel parallels to the to parenting experience risk for for parents of kids with neurodevelopmental conditions and uh, both both the, the disability and behavioral problems when the two are linked together. And this, this, uh, there was some interesting data presented by, by our colleagues on the Parenting Matters study in the last webinar, uh, uh, Lucy Locke and Peter Rosenbaum and Daphna Cohen uh, spoke about s some of the risks for parenting when there is both a, 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 dis a developmental disability and, uh, and behavior problems and how that, that seems to bear upon the, the, the parenting experience. Um, the next point, Boyraz and, and Sayer report elements of income and family cohesion and self-efficacy to be linked with uh, psych psych psychological well-being for fathers in, in both the disability and non-disability group of, of, of fathers, which I, I think points to the complex array of factors and, and relationship of factors, which likely has a bearing on fatherhood, uh, both as it's enacted and, and experienced. Um, Yet overall, fathering a child with a disability consistently appears to be a, a different form or different nature of parenting or, or, per, or perhaps adds a, 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 sh, a, sh, a component or shifting component of the experience of fathering and, and how that is it perhaps it is, is conveyed. So I, I think the point of this is when we think about fathering, uh, a child with with a disability or health condition. This is complex terrain in terms in, in terms of seeking to understand the the components of 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 how that is is lived out and experienced. Um, several studies have found differences um, for for these fathers. And for instance, as as noted uh, in in the bottom bullet, fathers of children with disabilities may experience increased levels of self-acceptance, uh, yet are, are also, um, uh, t they also tend towards lower level of satisfaction in their life and higher parenting stress. Probably not a surprise to, to folks uh, who, are, who are part of this, this uh, webinar. Um, Ted, can we go to the next slide? And it really introduces the question of what is the impact uh, on mothers and fathers of caring for a child with a chronic health condition or disability, and um, you know, I, I I think that there's certainly 
these are relatively early days in terms of the literature, uh, uh, particularly related to to fathering. But the the and the, and the existing literature is mixed, with some st study, studies suggesting differences in in maternal and paternal stress and coping and mental health systems. Um, several suggest several, several of these studies suggest that mothers are at greater risk, and others suggest fathers to experience more stress, perhaps at different times along the caregiving uh, journey. But um, and, and then some studies suggest little difference between uh, parents' adaptation. And I think th th this literature is emerging, and and um, there is a, the, a lack of or a need for fine-grained examination and and uh, and a look at the the complex issues. And and I think uh, the, the need for uh, as I've spoken about the sort of a lifespan perspective and longitudinal work. Um, it, and really, I think is, you know this this area is just ripe for further development, and, and uh, particularly given the level of complexity. However, the last point uh, I think stands, which is consistent findings that parents who care for a child with a chronic health condition or disability are more stressed than parents of healthy children. So, in in, in summing up the the literature, as we think about sort of what are the, some of the key messages, Ted, if we can go to the next slide. Um, Certainly, the, we, we, we know more about mothers' experiences based on the, 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 the attention in, in the empirical work and theoretical work in this area. And, uh, and given the, the complexity of the, the, the determinants and, and, and issues such as time from diagnosis to adulthood, the shifts that may occur and the multiplicity of contributing considerations, it seems perhaps premature yet to to be to be conducting comparisons with mothers about the nature and extent of stress. the The, the question emerges: What is the com what is the experience for mothers and for fathers? And then and then how do we uh, link those together or contrast those? Um, the 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 literature is continues to to lack in terms of the 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 impact of chronic health conditions on fathers um, although we sh we've sure seen a growth in that literature over the last few years which is terrific um, and and so I, I hope that gives a bit of a uh, sort of an overlay of the literature and and a sense of some of the empirical and theoretical work and what we've tried to do here is as we move forward is as Ted as Ted spoke about to present several um, early qualitative studies that that try to do some of that fine-grained analysis, and what we've intentionally done in this presentation is is present to you some uh, fathering within diverse populations and look at some salient considerations that that we hope together tell a story about fatherhood as it's experienced and carried out. And Ted, can I turn it back to you to to give our our first uh, ex example of, of, a, of a study about fathers. Great, thanks David. And uh, this first study looks at uh, fathers' experience of caring for their child with the juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, this is a grounded theory study. For those of you who aren't uh, methodologists uh, or immersed in research, uh, grounded theory is a qualitative uh, methodology that uh, is really suited to helping us understand experience and meaning and a very rich, fine-grained, uh, nuanced uh, uh, sense of, uh, of father's experience. Qualitative research is, is really like the microscope that uh, social scientists uh, would use to zero in on experience and, and meaning. And while this research isn't uh, generalizable in the traditional sense of the word, uh, this, because of its uh, in-depth nature, it's very useful for sensitizing us to the kinds of issues that uh, fathers, in this case, may experience. We can't make the uh, mistake of assuming that uh, a particular father who's uh, in our office uh, talking about their situation is going to experience the kinds of things that we'll talk about here. But uh, this kind of research can sensitize us to the sorts of things that he might experience and the kinds of questions that we might ask uh, if we were to uh, uh, connect with him. So 
Um, this was a study that involved uh, a diverse sample of 22 fathers. And I just want to highlight uh, some key findings here and, and what fathers uh, talked about was the crisis of the diagnosis uh, stage for them. That uh, a diagnosis of JRA um, is um, sometimes uh, routine and straightforward, but sometimes symptoms can mimic uh, leukemia or much serious, more serious conditions. Uh, uh, it's, it doesn't just show up with the stiffness of joints. There can be high fevers and uh, uh, other sorts of internal uh, organ involvement uh, that can be um, often take a couple of weeks to diagnose. This is a very difficult uh, a time for families, uh, for mothers and fathers, uh, but uh, fathers talked about how hard this was uh, for them in dealing with it and how relieved they were to finally have a diagnosis and begin to understand uh, what could be done. JRA is a condition that really uh, uh, affects children uh, and uh, a key symptom is, uh, is the pain that, uh, that they have, stiff, uh, painful joints. And fathers talked about how difficult this was for them to see their child in pain, uh, wishing that they could somehow uh, take on their child's pain. And uh, this was uh, really compounded uh, when uh, they uh, were also involved in some of the medical uh, regimen at home, which uh, sometimes involved uh, uh, injecting their child uh, with, uh, with needles. Uh, and uh, the whole idea of inflicting pain then on their child was, uh, was really difficult uh, for fathers and triggered a kind of protective uh, response uh, in them. JRA, like many conditions, uh, is very has an, an uncertain progress uh, prognosis. Rather, many children grow out of it uh, in adolescence, uh, whereas others may uh, end up in a wheelchair and uh, it may progress uh, in a more serious way. And a few children uh, uh, do actually die from uh, uh, their diagnosis and uh, course of illness. And so there's a great deal of uncertainty that is connected with this. And dealing with this over a long period of time, uh, what the literature has referred to as um, sustained uncertainty, uh, had uh, a real impact uh, on fathers and the kind of wear and tear because sometimes their child was completely uh, normal in terms of being able to participate uh, uh, in events and, and healthy in that way. And other times, uh, really with the flick of a switch, uh, could uh, wind up in hospital or a very uh, sort of painful uh, joints again. And they had many worries, not surprisingly, about their child's uh, future. Clearly questions about uh, prognosis and uh, potential organ damage due to uh, the drugs. And would their child become disfigured over time? Uh, uh, would their daughter or son and about two-thirds of patients uh, with JRA are female. Would they be able to work and provide for a family? Uh, uh, would their sons or daughters be marriageable? And what's the future going to uh, hold for them? So interesting uh, uh, findings, and we begin to uh, see in a, in a more in-depth way uh, how fathers um, uh, responded. And if we look at, at some begin to look at some of their strategies for responding then. Uh, it was very interesting that fathers um, deliberately talked about trying to be positive and optimistic uh, and that they, um, they, they talked about uh, different factors that, uh, that shape this. Uh, for fathers who were religious, uh, they may have uh, felt simultaneously that, uh, that God had some purpose uh, in this for them and everything happens for a purpose. Um, perhaps to some extent uh, it was uh, a kind of um, um, imposition of, uh, of will or a kind of inherent uh, um, denial of the seriousness of the condition. Uh, in some cases it seemed perhaps to uh, complement their partner's uh, response, uh, who they uh, routinely saw as more attuned to the uh, emotional dimensions of what was happening uh, with their child. And if they thought their partner was being too negative, uh, they were 
trying to balance that somehow with being positive and optimistic. They prided themselves in taking a, a, a kind of a pragmatic, uh, well, let's just deal with it uh, approach. Uh, these are the cards that we've been, been dealt. Uh, this is what we have to do. There's no point in wallowing in our sorrow. Let's just get on with it and, and do the best we can. And interestingly, fathers talked about a kind of silver lining. And they saw having a child with a health condition as bringing them closer to their child, that they really had to reevaluate the relationship. And it became a kind of catalyst for a more meaningful involvement with their child. They felt that their child's condition, um, in many cases, they felt it brought them closer together with their partner, brought the family closer together. They felt that they were stronger, that their child was stronger, more sensitive, more attuned to the hardships in the world and the kinds of conditions that uh, others face. And so this is um, often associated uh, with a positive adaptation, finding some um, meaningful component uh, to the uh, illness as well. And of course, I'm sure many of you have heard about this, uh, this notion of striving for normalcy. And uh, parents wanted their child to be normal, but recognized that they couldn't always participate in all the ways that they, they wanted to. And yet they would still uh, support them to sign up for figure skating classes or, or dance or, or baseball or hockey. And uh, you know, if they saw their child uh, fall on the ice or slide into second base, they would just be on the edge of their seats uh, hoping everything was OK. And some of this is about um, helping your child revision uh, possibilities. And so this is a quote from one dad. We tell him to reach for the stars, but he has to find the stars that are within his reach. Where the research got very interesting was uh, in talking with fathers about their emotional expression. And it was clear that fathers were profoundly affected and um, in my meetings with them expressed a broad range of feelings of uh, fear, anxiety, anger, guilt, sadness, devastation, and so forth. Uh, and yet they were, they also talked about being reluctant to express the extent of their feelings uh, in the context of the family. Uh, not wanting to show any kind of fear or weakness to their child. They felt that they needed to be a source of support for their child. And also with their with their partner, if they, if they saw their partner as attuned to the emotional dimensions of what was happening, then they didn't want to do anything that would potentially make them a burden to their partner. They felt that they had to be strong for others in, in periods of high stress. And, and so th this is where we can begin to see a kind of complementarity uh, uh, in the families. And this complementarity was there even when uh, fathers, I'm thinking of, uh, of a really quite a high-powered lawyer who was in the study and uh, he was uh, the exception to the, uh, the sort of the general observation in the sense that he saw himself as the one uh, attuned to the emotional dimensions of what was going on and his partner, his wife was the source of strength through it all and uh, saying the kinds of things that uh, I might otherwise have heard from, uh, from fathers in the study about uh, being, uh, being strong and getting on with things and uh, um, finding ways to proceed. And um, so this really uh, triggered this, for most fathers though, this, uh, this identity uh, as a protector. And, uh, and um, the form that this uh, often took was, uh, in, at least in the study, fathers talked about sometimes seeing themselves as the most likely one to, uh, if someone in the family has to be unpopular with the healthcare team, Fathers would rather it be them because uh, they recognized that it was more likely that uh, that their their partner would be uh, having more contact with the healthcare team, and uh, they could afford to be the the bad one uh, if if uh, the team was angry at uh, at one of the parents. And consequently, strong reliance on uh, self support, uh, and you can see here just different strategies: prayer, exercise, information gathering, alone time. And uh, fathers um, still saw their partner as their primary source of support, um, except when 
there were periods of high stress and your partner was you know, also involved in the uh, in the stress and, and at those times is when fathers felt they needed to be uh, protective so here's the, uh, uh, the the model if you will of uh, how fathers uh, interpreted uh, uh, their role they uh, talked about being uh, their role as a caregiver and uh, being very involved in changing diapers up at night and participating in the med medical regimen. Fathers also talked about how they engaged with their child through play. And sometimes the, the dads were a little bit sheepish when they talked about this, uh, that it was kind of frivolous to play with their kids. Uh, but um, as they talked about the experience, you, you could see how this was really imbued with, uh, with teaching and uh, relating and, and a very kind of uh, it requires a kind of empathic involvement uh, to uh, engage in play with uh, uh, with children. It's a very intimate experience, and, and interestingly, uh, um, since this research, some of the attachment uh, research that is coming out uh, really talks about the importance of physical contact, uh, contact, uh, and play um, in the way that uh, that fathers would form an attachment attachment with their children. The role of provider, interestingly, all but one of the fathers uh, saw their caregiver role as their primary role. And the one father who didn't, who saw his provider role as his primary, really talked about um, he was an, an anxious father and uh, felt that he really needed to do everything to keep his job so that he could provide for the family. And this uh, finally, this notion of uh, protector and advocate that I've talked about. David, back to you. Thanks, Ted. Um, I, you know, we, we have we have argued uh, or are trying to make the argument for to some degree a non-categorical approach to thinking about fathering because I think it's interesting in, in this study looking at fathers of children with cancer, some, not all, but some of the findings that Ted found in, in his GRA study were, were very similar, yet the population here is a uh, a, a group of fathers whose ch children faced a life-threatening condition. Again, this is a, a grounded theory study that really was, uh, the, the sample size is small and the focus is on depth rather than breadth and d depth of ex experience. And Ted, in, in the interest of time, I'm wondering if we could skip the next two slides and go to the slide with the, the triangle that really um, summarizes these slides in terms of the experience. And, and, and I, I just want to focus on some of the, the key points here, which, um, you know, this, this busy slide speaks to, I think, a, a, a movement or an adaptational process that fathers experience. And they speak about, you know, understandably, this experience of, of a child's uh, diagnosis and condition of cancer as, as, a, as what they term, one father termed as a devastating experience, and that, that brought difficult emotions and a role confusion. Uh, and, and the role confusion really was, was akin to some of what Ted has spoken about, fathers um, grappling with um, not being able to do what they view themselves to do and be as fathers in terms of protecting their family and, and um, uh, pushing back against this diagnosis and this experience and, and struggling with that and, and living with that largely in isolation in terms in order to protect the family. So the, the role of provider was put in parallel, those points on the left there of the triangle. And yet what we found was fathers talked about ways that they resisted or strategies that they used. And those really are the list on the right side there. Um, and, and some of those were, were doing what they could for family stability and, and um, ensuring that the needs of uh, or seeking that, that the needs of, of their family, both their children and their partner, uh, were, were addressed in varying degrees. And, and, and learning over time to, to, to find ways to promote sustainability and, and, and developing attitudes that were, uh, po were hopeful and positive. And, and, and um, the support issue was interesting. They, they valued support yet struggled with support and, and often relied on their partner yet, yet also wanted to protect their partner. So, so they found themselves in this, this odd place of, of trying to navigate that and yet, uh, when they when they did accept support, that was highly valued. And and Ted spoke about the notion of of 
meaning making and, and um, seeking to move forward. And in this case, fathers grappled in varying degrees of spirituality and hope. And it was really about um, providing a lens to move forward amidst the suffering. And so this notion of adaptation. Yet I think that the point in, in, the, in the center of the triangle um, really speak to some of the challenges. The, the, the lack of systems of support that really focused on, on fatherhood and, um, and spoke to fathers in ways that where, where that support was palatable and was um, focused on an end that, that, uh, that resonated for them. And, and, they, and they grappled with, with discourses of fatherhood that um, fit and didn't fit. So fathers as stoic or, or, or the strength of fathers when they didn't feel strong in dealing with this, yet, yet didn't want to impose that sense of um, not being there for their families. So just sort of held it in. And, uh, it, it's similar to, to the, the points of, that Ted spoke about uh, with, with the JRA fathers. And, and so I think um, when we think about um, supporting fathers and, 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 and really identifying them as a group where some of our support systems aren't well targeted, uh, I, I think I'll, I'll stop at that point and turn it back over to you, Ted. I, I wanted to give us lots of time to focus on the couple study and the Parenting Matters study. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, and I think it's fair to say through all of this, uh, as we were uh, involved in, in different studies looking at, uh, at the experience of fathers, um, we couldn't help but see uh, mothers uh, somehow silhouetted in the data that fathers were describing their, their actions, and their, their thinking, their, their feeling, their making sense of the situation. Uh, it wasn't in a vacuum, it was, it was in the context of the relationship. And so uh, David and I worked together with a number of uh, researchers here to uh, do a, a study uh, looking at, uh, in particular, at how mothers and fathers co-construct their roles uh, as parents. And this was uh, funded by, uh, uh, by SHRC and it was part of a, a, a Canada-wide uh, study. Uh, the main focus was on, uh, on fathers and looking at new fathers, young fathers, gay fathers, immigrant fathers, aboriginal fathers, separated and divorced fathers, and, and this other study uh, that uh, David and I were involved in looking at, uh, at, at couples. So, um, and the, the rationale for this was just that, that we didn't have a good understanding of the gestalt of a couple's experience. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about family systems and family-centered care, but really we've known more about the individuals, uh, the child, the mother, the siblings, and so forth, and we, we wanted to move on from that. And so this, this study really evolved. And um, it was interesting, David had done some earlier uh, uh, research uh, uh, examining the experience of mothers and we found ourselves thinking about this research in relation to the couple study. So for mothers who talked about feeling trapped, well what does that say about the relationship with the father? Uh, where was he in, in the caregiving and uh, what was his role in the family uh, in those circumstances? Or what about mothers whose caring role was such an essential part of her identity you know, as a person? What space was there for the, uh, the father to be uh, engaged in parenting? How did he fit in that kind of configuration? What would that look like uh, in a family? So these were the kinds of questions that we had. And, and again, gee, you're probably getting a sense that we like uh, um, qualitative research and grounded theory studies. And, uh, and so this was another grounded theory study. And, and the, the attraction really for grounded theory is, is that um, it really it, it wrestles with trying to form uh, an explanation to develop a theory. So it, it takes the research a little further than uh, uh, some qualitative uh, research studies. So 20 couples, uh, five of whom we interviewed uh, as individuals and as couples. And again, uh, quite a diverse uh, uh, sample, 45% uh, identifying with uh, some kind of uh, ethnocultural group. And <clears throat> I'm just going to jump uh, forward here to the results. And <clears throat> Clearly in the, uh, in the families, the, uh, the mothers and fathers uh, talked about some shared kinds of experiences. And for many of you, these won't be surprising. They talked about their worries for their child. Uh, uh, the, the 
worrying about stigma and so forth, F feeling different from other families, uh, yet striving to fit in and, and be normal. Uh, just the struggles in looking after their child and, uh, and balancing things with their, with their other children. Financial strains we've talked about, balancing work inside the home and outside, and of course less uh, individual and couple time. Uh, and in this study, the uh, majority of, uh, in the majority of families, the mother was more uh, involved inside the home, the father worked more hours outside the home, and this is uh, fairly typical. Um, we found ourselves really wrestling with uh, how to make sense of, uh, of what was happening. Uh, uh, this was a new area of research. We didn't find uh, any literature that really uh, looked at this. Uh, existing studies that looked at, uh, at mothers and fathers really looked at who experienced more stress in the family. And, and so the, it wasn't really about how the couple functioned and, and their identities as parents. And so we um, found ourselves beginning to think in terms of complementarity and symmetry and some of the key domains of caregiving and managing the household and, and breadwinning. And so complementarity, we've got just a few quotes we want to share with you to, to uh, hopefully uh, uh, convey what, uh, what this is really about. So um, this first uh, quote is, uh, is the mom and she says, uh, usually there has to be one who's strong. I mean, like tough and strong and one who gives love. It can't be both. And the father says, the heart and the brain. And here's the interviewer uh, uh, asking, what do you do every day with your child? This is to the father. Uh, uh, what, are, what are your daily routines? And the father responds, my wife can tell you better. <laughs> so we might wonder what kind of a relationship it is in terms of uh, uh, how they balance the, the caregiving uh, and looking after the children at home. Uh, this looks like a complementary uh, relationship where the father is less engaged in, in these activities, the mother more engaged. Here's a, a mom's uh, comment, uh, complementary with shared values. Anyway, I think we represent two sides of parenting, but we have the same values. And two sides of parenting, uh, kind of uh, uh, interesting uh, thought there. And symmetry, the interviewer says, so it's sort of like you both can do it all. You tag off back and forth. And the mother says, yeah, he's just as good as I am. So in, in symmetry, they would share some, they would have common skills and share functions more in the, within the family rather than in complementary kinds of ways, having uh, distinct roles, skills symmetrical relationships. Here's a father he says, I want my kids to see that in today's society, it's not just the traditional breadwinner, it's the caregiving also because you need both. I think you need both as a parent. And the interviewer says to a father, caregiving is sometimes more associated with the roles of mothers and women. What are your thoughts uh, on this as you parent your child? Father, I think it's a pile of crap. And so this was a father who was very engaged in uh, uh, looking after his, his child at home and uh, uh, in a symmetrical relationship with his partner. Now this quote uh, is actually from a, a father in, a, in, a, in, in one of the fatherhood studies, but it uh, is so much uh, about the relationship. And he, and he says here, I look at this really as a balance, the balance of the male and the female. Whether you are male or female, the challenge is to get that balance within yourself. Quite often in relationships, people are looking to the other person to fulfill that aspect of themselves, which is kind of like a crutch. It's depending on that other person to fill your need. And really, I think what we're discovering is that we have both. So complementarity and symmetry, we found ourselves thinking about. It. And when we began to look at overall how couples function, we found that most couples seem to combine elements of this uh, in the way that they worked together. It wasn't either or, it was both. And here's a, a diagram just uh, um, showing this as a continuum. And on the, uh, the left hand end here, we can see a complementary arrangement. On the right hand end, a more symmetrical, symmetrical rather, arrangement, shared roles. And then where most families were, were somewhere in this middle zone here, whoops, uh, uh, with some 
some aspects of their parenting which was complementary and some aspects uh, which was uh, symmetrical. And so we found ourselves thinking about parent adaptation and we were really thinking about uh, developing a model and what that might look like. And what became very clear to us was that there was not just one model for success. And in fact, we found the ideas of traditional transitional egalitarian uh, uh, language not really uh, very helpful. And that adaptation is really much more um, you know, individual. It's, it's, it's relative, it's practical, it reflects what the couple is able to do. And that success can take different forms at different times. And um, David, I think I'm just going to skip over some of this. Uh, um, and maybe we can return to it. But clearly we found a lot of factors that uh, seem to be influential that parents talked about, some of the factors that shaped their relationship. And uh, you might remember back to the uh, theoretical lens that we were talking about and identifying the social ecological model, and we can see here that some of these factors are, we could slot in at the micro level or the meso or, or macro level and so forth. And some of the kinds of adaptational processes that parents talked about, uh, really quite a number uh, of, of um, skills, if you like, uh, that, uh, that parents talked about that they found um, important for them as a couple in uh, being successful navigating their relationship. And in the end, some of the criteria of, uh, or attributes of, uh, of success, balance, that uh, the, the, the work uh, that needed to be done was balanced. It was a fairness to the caregiving and, and the range of roles. And that it fit for individuals, whether it fit on the level of time and availability, whether it fit in terms of preferences and skills and just liking to do one task rather than another. Uh, couples worked out for themselves uh, what was going to uh, work for them. And in a few families, uh, this issue of, well, was the arrangement good enough for them uh, emerged. And well, in most couples, uh, they have their moments. <laughs> the parenting configuration uh, uh, for most of us who are in relationships, it's not always perfect, but uh, often good enough. Uh, and um, But in some families, there was this kind of tipping point where it just seemed to cross a line and it was no longer uh, working. And whether this was um, because of changes in their lives or just, just the maturation, life trajectory, uh, changes at work, changes in the child's need to and led to some conflict and uh, so forth. I'm definitely going to skip over this one, David. Uh, this was a model that we tried to uh, put together to uh, really, again, capture some of the complexity. But I think that I'm going to uh, leave it here and uh, pass it back to you, David. Sure, and I, I think that model really speaks to the complexity that w that we're we we're finding that uh, this isn't a, a one size fits all, and that it's really a multi factorial factorial approach in terms of thinking about the complexities, and it really leads nicely to where we're at with the Parenting Matters study. And um, what I want to talk about is one sub study of the larger um, the the CHR funded team that was looking at Parenting Matters that uh, Peter and Lucy and Daphna. Are, are, are co-leading and then there's a group of us who are part of that wonderful project with various strands and I want to recognize our, our team members that were on the previous slide um, but I what what we are looking for there is really looking at this this nuanced understanding of, of these these, this, these complexities of, of what is it that is this notion of parenting a child, in this case with, neuro, with a range of neurodevelopmental disabilities, and, uh, and both how is that enacted and how is that experienced. And this, this is a, a national study that uh, we are embarking on, and we, are, we're, uh, uh, we have just begun to recruit for this study. So we're more presenting this, the, the study to you as a, as, as a, 
a sort of a reflective conceptual piece of 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 bringing together together these this uh, multi-layered perspective of what goes into the notion of in this case fathering and or mothering and together uh, uh, parenting as as uh, as mothers and fathers co-create this this journey of of the parenting experience so um, we're, we're seeking to understand this and, and we're collecting data in Alberta Ontario and Quebec as it's indicated there and and uh, our, we have some core questions about um, what aspects of parenting do mothers and fathers to perceive to make a difference in, in terms of day-to-day day -day parenting. And, and we're really building on the study that Ted just spoke about. How do we move forward in, in understanding how, how mothers and fathers individually and as a unit uh, navigate parenting and experience it? Um, and, and I think that... Uh, Ted, if we can go to the next slide, we're, we're asking the question, what difference does parenting make? And I think where we've come to, and I hope we've conveyed in, in our presentation, that um, there, are, there are, appears to be a, a range of contributing determinants to that experience. And this picture really is trying to de depict that. So mothering, fathering on the left collude in terms of this co-parenting but are, are also related to the, the outcomes, but those outcomes of, for the children may have a bearing on parenting as well. So issues of child participation, child quality of life, and we, we could add child functioning and the complexity of the, of the disability. And, and so that's what we're doing in the studies, really seeking what are the determinants. And, and we've, we've really built on a base, of, a broad base of what are the potential contributing variables. So I'm going to walk through very quickly some of the variables. If you go to the next slide, Ted, there's a range of child variables. So child function on the left there. Child, and, and we, we have both the construct, the measure, and the author, just for people's reference. But really, we're looking at a range of child-based variables to say what bearing may the, the child's uh, function or, or, or the, 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 the issues related to the child, so their participation, their sense of mastery, their, their health, their quality of life. What may that have, bearing may that have on the parenting experience? And if we go to the next slide, we're looking at um, also at family environment variables. So the supports and services that can be accessed, the functioning of the family, the impact of, of the child's, child's disability on the family. So again, a range of potential areas that may have a bearing. And, and if we go to the next slide, we're focusing there on, on social environmental variables. So the community and the, the, the I interaction with the relationship with, with the school, which, which is where children spend a good part of their, their weekday. Um, and then, as, as, we, as Ted has just illustrated in, in the, the study uh, on couples, uh, we're, if we go to the next slide, Ted, we're looking at um, the couple relationship and, and what bearing may that have on the, the, the parenting journey and, and experience and the process of parenting and how does co-parenting come to be? And lastly, uh, or sorry, almost lastly, we're looking at parenting variables in terms of the, the, the well-being of the individual parents, so physical health, depressive symptoms, what is the financial status, and we're looking at the impact uh, and of, of fi finances and, and uh, both assets and liabilities in terms of assets, where, where, what are the costs and what are the, the, uh, the, the strains in terms of potential income on families, um, and how does that bear on family and parent experience. And, and lastly, we're looking at that notion of parenting as experienced, so, uh, which really looks at what are some parent pro protective factors, what is the notion of hope, and how does that relate to parenting, um, and, and the impact of the disability. And so really what this is getting at is, if we go to the next side, a multifactorial perspective of what makes a difference to parenting. What are the, 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 the moving parts that emerge in terms of uh, in determining uh, how parenting is experienced and enacted, and how does that play out both for mothers and for fathers? And uh, so uh, we return to this this busy slide, just speaking to the complexity of the variables. And um, as we look at um, uh, mothering and fathering as reflecting and having a bearing on in the center, the the parenting style, the relationship, the context and how those various 
uh, components play out to that parenting and that mothering and fathering experience, but it doesn't happen in a vacuum. So above and below the picture here are um, the resources that, that will support that, and that has a, a, a reflects policy and the discourse related to uh, who mothers are, who fathers are, and what parenting looks like in the context of a neurodevelopmental condition. And lastly, how does the child, in terms of their participation, their functioning, their quality of life, how does that play into this parenting experience and vice versa? So it's a, it's a complex picture that we're grappling with here. And I, I, I think that, and, and I would just say, just uh, before I move on, we're, we're, as, as I said, we're beginning the study and we're just recruiting. So if I can put a plug in here for if people are interested in knowing more and or becoming engaged in this, we are recruiting uh, at, in Edmonton, Calgary, Toronto, Hamilton, and Montreal. And um, I, I think Doug is going to put some particulars following the webinar. And one of the things that we'll, we'll convey is a phone number if people and, and, and uh, email if people are interested in, in finding more about this and or uh, potentially getting involved in terms of recruiting. So um, to sum up these, these complex elements that we've, we've tried to convey in, in terms of thinking about this uh, fatherhood and, and parenting journey, um, we, we have tried to sum it up in some uh, implications uh, and, and perhaps questions in moving forward. Um, so some of these are, uh, I think, if we, what are the key messages? Fathers are profoundly affected uh, both positively and negatively in terms of caring for a child with a health condition. Um, it appears that fathers may be reluctant to share how they are feeling or coping, and, I, I, and particularly if they're worried about burdening their partner or, their, or other family members. And that has a real implication for uh, how we support fathers and, and the assumptions we make in terms of how, how fathers are managing in, in, in the parenting journey. Um, one parent's story about the relationship is insufficient to understand the total gestalt. And there may be three or multiple stories, the, the mother's experience, the father's experience, and then the, the couple's experience as they co-navigate this process. Um, accordingly, it, it, it appears that parenting roles and behaviors are best understood within the context of, of both the individual and the multiplicity of other uh, considerations. So the couple, family, social relationships, and context. And just one more slide of some implications as we finish up here. Um, so uh, I think the point in number five is that a, a cookie cutter approach in terms of thinking about parenting may not be as helpful. And, and for instance, uh, more father or mother involvement for that matter isn't necessarily better per se. Um, but we need to consider the context of, of the couple and the, and the co-parenting relationship and look at, at the depth of that. Um, so uh, successful care, care parenting and caregiving configurations may take different forms and different stages. And we need to think about this as an, an emerging process and think, think about a lifespan approach, which often hasn't been as present in the literature. Um, complementarity and symmetry, these notions that were presented in, in the earlier study that Ted spoke about, seem to be useful and promising concepts for understanding how parents work out their roles and in trying to articulate some of the, the complexity here. And lastly, uh, uh, it, it appears a, you know, a, a multifactorial factorial model is needed to, to get at the complexity and range of factors. And I, I hope we've, we've, we've uh, we've conveyed that uh, as we sort of walk through these, these exemplars of, of various studies and, and approaches to think about uh, how fathering is, is both understood and enacted. I think I'll stop there. And uh, Doug, can I turn it over for you, to you? And if there's any questions or comments? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, there has been a question come in. But before we get to the questions, maybe I could uh, flip around those two uh, other poll questions. Yeah, I think we were, were there three three other questions. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you're right. There were three other questions. So, I, so uh, this will just give me a chance to remind people that we do have a couple of questions that have come in. But uh, for those of you who haven't uh, asked a question, put a uh, typed a question into the question box, um, feels 
please feel free to do that and we will uh, do these three next poll questions and then we'll get into the, the questions from the audience. So the, uh, the poll question, the next poll question is, are there programs in your center specifically dedicated to supporting fathers? And this again is a yes or no question. So 84% have said no, that they don't have programs in their center specifically dedicated to supporting fathers. 16% have said yes. The next question is, should there, uh, so if, if either if you do or don't, should, should there be programs specifically dedicated to supporting fathers? All right, interesting results here. We've got 97% have said yes, there should be specific programs for, for, for fathers, and 3% have said no. There shouldn't, there doesn't, I'm assuming they're saying there doesn't need to be specific programs. And I'm sure they have nothing against fathers. Um, and the last question we uh, that we the poll question is uh, is a social justice perspective needed for understanding the degree of father involvement? And the results are 65% said a social justice perspective is needed for understanding the, understanding the degree of father involvement, and 35% said no, a social justice perspective is not needed. So that's the end of the the poll questions. Um, just maybe you could comment on that uh, that question about specific programs for fathers. My, my, my assumption is the people that said that there, that there doesn't need to be specific programs are assuming that the family should be addressed as a whole. That, I'm just probably putting words in someone's mouth, but but that just seems to me to be what what they must what I'm assuming they're getting at in that question. Any comment on that? Well, you know, I I, I think it's an, an interesting question, and and I I wonder, you know, it'd be interesting to to dialogue further about this, but. It may be an issue of the question itself. So people may may say, "I'm not sure about a, a program per se, but rather activities of support for fathers." That might be a point of distinction, and or your your uh, interpretation, Doug, which suggests that um, that there there we it may be more helpful to think about this in a broader way in terms of the family. But mm -hmm. I, but I, I I think that what we've tried to convey is. There may be some targeted needs that fathers may experience, and these these appear to to uh, occur across uh, conditions that we may not be as effectively targeting, sort of understanding and targeting in in our in our our, our current methods of support, and and may invite us to really think about how could we support fathers in a better way? What would that look like? And uh, I think it really calls for us to think critically about that, and 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 it's really, I think, a call for uh, increased interventional research in this area. Yeah, th those are those are great comments, and uh, I think we would also feel sympathetic uh, to uh, organizations uh, in the sense that um, uh, it is uh, a challenge to provide all the services that may be needed, and. Uh, uh, we would all recognize that uh, we might want to provide ser services that we don't have the resources uh, to do. Um, it might be worth uh, uh, people knowing that there are uh, some uh, programs out there that do offer um, uh, parenting programs uh, that are specifically uh, directed to fathers. And this was uh, developed to um, uh, ad address a general gap uh, in this. and. Uh, there has been some research that looks at uh, what seems to work with uh, with fathers, and uh, and uh, in each um, province, I'm sure there are uh, uh, organizations that do this. Uh, so it might be worth um, checking online or checking with some of the groups uh, that may be available, and and we could probably steer you uh, around that too. All right. Uh, we had to, so I'll just start getting into the questions from the audience and maybe prompt a bit more discussion here. Um, yeah, so the first question, there was actually a couple of people picked up on this point early on in the presentation. I think it was Ted, that, you that was speaking at this time, but you were, you were going over some of the, 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 the studies at the beginning. I think it was the JRA dads um, and the, the need for or their, their issues with an inability to control the situation or to be the provider or protector of the child, et cetera. And a, and a couple of the questions said more or less, it seems, the one person specifically says, it seems to me that all of the father's struggles, crisis of diagnosis and prognosis, inability to help a child's pain, the uncertainty of the chronic illness, fear of change of the child, et cetera, et cetera, 
uh, all deal with that inability to control the situation or provide and protect the child. I mean, you, you did mention this a, a number of times uh, throughout the presentation about protection and, and the control issue, but can you speak a little bit more on this? Um, can you speak more about the protection idea? Yeah, just in, in that it seems that seems to be this person I at least identified early on in the presentation that that seems to be the focus of the father's struggles that inability to control or be that provider or protector of the child. Yeah, I, gee, I, I don't I don't know that that would be uh, um, the key finding that I would uh, I would sort of um, say would be absolutely central to this. Uh, and th the issue of I know. Uh, the the issue of control has uh, has come up, and I, I think uh, David had summarized some literature that talked about that. But uh, the, the fathers in the JRA study didn't really talk a lot about the issue of control. It was more like they um, they didn't like that their child had been diagnosed with uh, with this condition, but felt that they really couldn't do very much about some of it, uh, and they just had to get on with. Uh, trying to do what was in their control to uh, to be able to do and that was to you know make the best decisions around the treatment and uh, and you know follow uh, the treatment regimen and so forth uh, um, I think it's it would be fair to say though that there would be some tension around this uh, for fathers uh, who um, who routinely did embrace this notion of, of themselves as a protector and this is uh, Probably a traditional role that we might uh, associate with uh, with fathers, uh, um, but fathers um, they couldn't control the pain that their child had, uh, and that kind of stuff was hard for them. Uh, and they talked about how how tough that was uh, seeing their child in pain, being able to uh, not being able to to take that away really. And, and is that, that helps or not, or not? But yeah, and I was I was just sort of wondering is is I mean these studies looked at the father's experience, but has there is, is there has there been a comparison between fathers and mothers in this sense in this in some of these issues or? I think most of the uh, the comparison studies have been uh, uh, more surveys, so asking. Uh, uh, set questions or using uh, various instruments to examine uh, things like um, uh, level of uh, depression, for example, or level of stress associated with uh, caring for the child. And um, I, I think what's been uh, more unique about the research that David and I have talked about is that uh, it has taken um, a qualitative approach and therefore uh, a desire to uh, really to, to try and get under the surface a little bit more to, to see how the fathers and mothers work together to uh, to care for the child and balance everything else in their lives. Yeah, I would agree, Ted. And I, I think the the notion of of control is interesting and really I think invites further thinking about that. I, I mean, I I think it's it it relates to um, trying to manage adver adverse aversive circumstances and being a protector, making things right for the child, and so how that fits with sort of controlling circumstances is um, pretty related to that protective role. And Doug, your, your comment about is that different for, for mothers, I, I, you know, I, I think that we, there really is, is a need for further looking at that. I think certainly the mother literature speaks to the, the desire to, to protect and, and control and make things better for the child. But I, my, my sense is, and Ted, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but sort of the, the nuanced difference there, and this might be um, overgeneralizing, probably is, but the, 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 the focus on the literature of mothering really seems to be the, the attention to the, the caring in the moment. And while concerns over sort of the future are certainly there and, and protecting, thinking about sort of one one's child in the context of the surrounding threats to the, the well-being of that child and family are certainly present in, in the mother's purview. There seems to be sort of a, a, a nuanced difference of mothers are, are often very present in the caring moment and, and the, the focus of the experience relates there. So Ted, would you agree with that? 
Oh yeah, absolutely, David. Uh, and uh, there's a great uh, uh, book that uh, uh, Andrew Doucette uh, wrote, uh, uh, published recently, and it's entitled uh, "Do Men Mother?" And it goes to this sort of central question of uh, of what parenting looks like uh, from the vantage point of uh, of men and women. And uh, um, so Andrea's conclusion is that, uh, well, there are some, some similarities, but also some important differences that, as a group, fathers may uh, seem to demonstrate uh, an interest in encouraging more independence and uh, you know, even uh, risk-taking uh, behaviors uh, in a healthy way, I think, uh, as meant. Uh, whereas moms are more focused on, uh, on the child's well-being and the, the caregiving and the physical contract contact uh, in caring uh, and there's more support uh, for that uh, generally within society uh, of the, that kind of um, caregiving role for mothers and and mothers may see that as uh, support or or paradoxically that may feel like uh, pressure to some mothers that they they ought to assume the uh, the primary role in caregiving and that could uh, could feel like uh, like a hardship too so this notion of similarities and differences, uh, again, I, I think is uh, is really so interesting, and, and it it takes us to questions of uh, of gender and how we understand uh, what it is to be uh, a man or a woman in 2012. Uh, what does that look like in the context of, uh, of of parenting and the kinds of roles that that are appropriate to men and women? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, well, thanks. Um, the, the next question that we had come in from the audience was, could you advise as to how best to engage dads in research? Uh, not many respond to this person's invites in her experience. Now, I'll warn you, this question is coming from one of our colleagues in Australia, so I don't know if you can speak to the international differences in fathers, but uh, there may be some similar issues here in Canada. Uh, well, David, I, I don't know whether you want to comment. Uh, I'm happy to comment. Uh, sure, go ahead, Ted. On this one, uh, uh, well, I I think that, that there are some challenges uh, recruiting uh, fathers, um, but sometimes uh, some of those challenges are, are of our own making, uh, uh, and um, often we we just sort of dismiss fathers. We say, oh, we can't we can't get them because uh, we you know we never see them, or we want to do our research in in the clinic, and we do know mostly it's uh, it's mothers who come to clinic, and so it's convenient for us as researchers to. Uh, to gather information from mothers. Um, and to get information for fathers uh, who are more likely uh, uh, doing the, uh, the, you know, the paid work uh, outside the family during clinic hours, uh, we might have to be more flexible uh, to uh, engage them. Uh, but my own experience has been that, uh, that fathers respond to invitations and if the research and the research that we did with fathers, about fathers, they were only too glad to uh, talk about this. And, and interestingly, some of the fathers said, and I originally ended the interviews by asking, uh, well, you know, what was this like for you to talk about your experience? And they were so grateful for the opportunity to, to talk. They said, you know, I just, you know, wish that I'd had a chance to talk about this uh, much earlier. And you could just see the kind of conflict that they had at the time that, that feelings were so uh, ripe for them that they, they felt uh, this need to be strong sometimes and not wanting to uh, appear uh, weak or uh, unready for the, for the challenge. And, and yet uh, we're, we're experiencing a broad range of things. And so it has to do with, it's, it's, it's like all these, these phenomena, there's, uh, there's a complexity to it. And uh, we need to think ourselves about uh, what we can do to enable it. I agree, Ted, and I, it reminds me a little bit of um, our colleague, Dr. Peter Rosenbaum's uh, commentary that was recently published where he posed the question, what is family-centered research? And uh, Peter, my apologies if I've misinterpreted that piece, but it was, it, was a, it was a nice commentary on really critically asking how how do we engage families in in research and do we do that effectively and how could we advance our models to do that and I, you know I'm struck by this important question and, and perhaps um, it, it invites us to, to think about how to to ask fathers how they would seek to be in, 
want, want to be involved in research or can we involve families earlier in the research process and begin to ask them um, how could they mean, meaningfully be engaged in a way that they would they would be compelled to be a part and we'd be asking the questions the research questions that that resonate with fathers and, and so you know I, th I think that is an important question and has a lot of nuances that really in, invite really some critical examination uh, in, in the context of fathers and mothers and, and families more generally. All right. Well, we, I did have a couple of questions about people wanting to get the, the PowerPoint presentation, et cetera. So I just popped up a quick slide just uh, to direct you to direct everyone to the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. You can see the URL at the top, which is uh, ken.cafc.org. Uh, and this information will be this presentation will be recorded and posted up there, so you can listen to the whole thing live as well. And if uh, if Ted and, and David are willing to share the, the actual PowerPoint as a PDF. Um, I'll be happy to post the, the PowerPoint slides up as well if it's available. I'm not sure if there's slides there that uh, would be are, are going for publishing, et cetera, that you wouldn't be allowed to share. But uh, the recording will be available, and you can just search uh, for parenting or the tag cloud. There, we tag this one and the previous parenting matters. One will be tagged with the uh, parenting tag, um, or you can just browse the child development and rehab category, which is where all of the information. Mostly that comes from our, our CAFC's Child Development and Rehab Program, which is our Canadian uh, network for child and youth rehab, um, is all is all posted in that that category on child development and rehab, including these presentations from the Parenting Matters team. Um, so I'm just going to uh, see if we have uh, we have one more question here. It says, from your point of view, is there any difference between how a father will parent a normally developed child? versus parenting a child with a chronic disability from a basic point of view. Doug, what was the last line you said from a... So I said, from, from your point of view, is there any difference between how a father will parent a normally developed child versus parenting a child with a chronic di disability from a basic point of view? I, I, you know, I, I can start, Ted, and feel free to jump in. I, I, it's a, it's a great question, and um, I, I think that the that is part of the, this the parenting matter study is really to look at how is is parenting enacted and experienced. Um, I, my perspective of of the the, the literature to date really speaks to a, an, a nuanced and and unique perspective of parenting, and I find myself thinking about: is is parenting fundamentally different, or is fathering fundamentally different when we add on the layer of a uh, a disability, or 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 add add to that layer a neurodevelopmental disability, and or other issues that may be part of the equation, like uh, behavior problems or 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 other complexities, and. Um, so is is it fundamentally different, or is it is it sort of a, a core parenting that is there's there's layers added on, and, and maybe that's a bit of a moot question. Uh, it, it seems, based on the information as as I gather it, that the nature of parenting is different, and and fathers come at it differently, and and they even talk about sort of a a different perspective of who they are and and how they approach parenting, and and they how they view. Their, their life in the context of other parameters of who they are and and, and their family and um, yet yet how that unfolds and 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 sort of what is the the nuanced differences I, I think these are early days as we try to to tr grapple with that Ted do you have thoughts on that yeah I I think those are great ideas uh, David and, and I, I would really uh, agree with what you're saying uh, and and fathers did talk about uh, their child's health condition as a catalyst for more meaningful involvement with their child and it, it really um, it forced them in many ways to to think differently about their child uh, and this notion of the silver lining that, that uh, they talked about as well that uh, in, in the way that they often found that they were more sensitive as a parent uh, because of the uh, the whatever challenges they faced in caring for the child. Uh, so I think that the, the child may present with some different needs and uh, that uh, require a response, but uh, really 
I think uh, whether we're talking about fathers or mothers, um, you know, parenting that is uh, warm and responsive, involved, uh, it's, um, it's empathic, and uh, uh, that bodes well for, uh, for both children and parents, I think. I, I think, too, it's important while we, we see how, how fathers and mothers grapple and move forward amidst the challenges, not to gloss, gloss over the, the very real challenges and strains and the impacts on on the, the parent and on the family um, as and, and and the children in the family as, as they navigate some of these the very real challenges that come along with with disabilities some related to the disability or the challenges of care but also the this the some the larger social factors that, that may be at play All right. Well, thank that. Thank you for that great discussion. I, I think we've got come to the end of the questions that have come in, and we are actually, as I look at my watch, we're quite a bit over time. We're almost ten minutes over time. But uh, you know, as usual, most of the audience has been able to stick around just to hear this the, the interesting discussion that always comes at the end of these webinars. So I'd like to thank uh, our presenters for being able to hang in for a little bit of overtime, as well as our audience, because they, I think I think this has been extremely valuable discussion. Um, so Ted, David, do you have any closing comments before we sign off? I would just say uh, thanks to you, Doug, and to CAFC for promoting this uh, this series. This is really a, a wonderful opportunity for people to come together and and talk about things such as uh, fatherhood that uh, are meaningful to our work, but um, also this kind of a topic uh, in one way or another touches uh, all of us uh, personally. But it's uh, it, it is a great way to enhance our our understanding and our our work with with mothers and fathers and families. I agree, and I, I just want to reiterate the the Parenting Matters study and, and again, put in a plug. If people are interested in engaging in that, we are recruiting uh, in, in Alberta and Ontario and Quebec. And uh, so if you're in, in those regions and would like to, to be involved, um, the, the number is 1877, sorry, 1877 492 Seven two one nine. That's a phone number to connect. One eight seven seven four nine two seven two one nine. And and we'll we'll convey that information if we can, Doug, afterwards as well. And I just want to thank CAFC, who is a KT partner in in that project. And uh, thank you for su your support in moving this agenda forward. Oh, it's certainly our pleasure. I mean, this has been such interesting work. And, and for that phone number, perhaps I could even uh, post it up on the Knowledge Exchange Network page where, where this presentation will be posted. I'll just include uh, some information about how to, how to get involved in the study if you're interested in recruiting for this study. Um, so that brings us to a close. And we'll also put up any other references that uh, David and Ted want to send along there. So check that page. We usually have the recordings up in about a week. It usually takes us to get everything up. But uh, you should see it there you know, within the next uh, six or seven days. So thanks again to everyone for, 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 for coming and to our speakers. As I said, this has been great, and we look forward to seeing everyone at uh, our upcoming webinars. All right, thanks, everyone, and goodbye.